Welcome to room nine, the region's largest classroom. I am Mrs. Wright and I teach at Monroe Elementary in St. Charles. Today I will be teaching a reading lesson meant for second graders, but as always, everyone, adults, children of all ages, anyone and everyone is welcome to join us. So, you're probably wondering why I'm dressed like this. And, you know, now that I see myself, I'm probably really gonna wonder that too. But I figured we could do something fun and different today. And we are going to have a poetry pajama party. Woo! Yeah. So, if you're not in your jammies, go put some jammies on. I have my normal clothes on. I just threw on a robe. Um, well, like my normal jammies, you know. And um, I just threw on my cozy robe. I have my slippers on. My hair is up in my nighttime bun with my um, little scrunchie in. Can't see it very well. And I am just ready to have this pajama party. So, if you want to join me in your jammies today, go run and put some on while I hear about your day. What have you been up to? How are you doing? Um, I, I have been, what have I been doing? Oh, I've been celebrating birthdays. My birthday, my husband's birthday, my dog's birthday, um, my little sister's birthday. Um, I have been doing a little too much online shopping, like Target and Amazon. Mr. Wright is not happy about that. Um, I am loving that our school year is up and running. I have a really awesome class. I bet your teacher loves you just as much as I love my new class. Um, so I hope you are doing well. I am happy that we're here today. So if you're back and you have your jammies on, um, let's go ahead and get started. Be thinking about what zone you are in. Are you in red, yellow, green, blue? I'm in a little bit of blue. I'm kind of tired today but I am happy to be here. So I'm gonna do some deep breaths, drink some water to wake myself up. Okay, let's do some deep breathing. Yes, deep breathing always helps me out. So let's look at our I can statement. So I can understand and identify the characteristics of poetry. I can read and analyze poetry and I can write a poem. So today we are going to learn about figurative language. And the reason we're learning about figurative language is because a lot of poets use figurative language in their writing. And figurative language can be kind of tricky to understand. So we're going to learn about the different types of figurative language. Then we're gonna read some poetry and kind of analyze it, talk about what we think it means, and then we're going to write some poetry, okay? Okay, here we go. So our first type of figurative language that we're going to talk about is alliteration. And alliteration is when you have the repetition of the same initial consonant sound. So let me write that down. So the, and repetition means to repeat. So repetition oops, of same Initial consonant Oops. There we go. So when I said poetry pajama party pa 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 p 
P is a consonant, and each one of those words started with P. So poetry pajama party, that is an example of alliteration. I'm gonna write that down. Poetry, poetry, PJ or pajama party is an example of alliteration. Can you think of another example of alliteration? Hmm, remember the same beginning sound, that first consonant sound. I love it, that's a good one. I was also thinking of like um, Horrible Harry or Happy Harry, right? So let's write that down. Happy Harry. Um, another one, when I teach second grade, I call you guys my sweet seconds. That's an example of alliteration. I love alliteration. I like naming things in my classroom with alliteration, like, oh, and now, of course, I'm trying to think of an example, and I, and I can't, but it, I, I feel like alliteration helps me to remember special things, okay? So, alliteration is the repetition of the same initial consonant sound, and this does happen in poetry. Here is another kind of figurative language is called, ooh, this is a big word, personification. Let me hear you say it. Yes, nice, personification. So that is when you give um, like traits to things that are to objects. So it's when um, you give, whoops, I wrote the wrong color. Give objects or animals human traits. Okay, and an example of that would be like lightning. Oop, if I spell it right, lightning. Yeah, lightning danced across the sky. Well, lightning can't really dance. It flashed, see this is part of the pajama party as I look a mess, but whatever. Lightning can't really dance. People can dance, but this lightning dance across the sky, you're painting a really good picture in someone's mind of what the lightning was doing. So that is personification. Could you think of any other examples of personification? Mm, those are some good ones. Some of those could fall under simile and metaphor, which we're gonna talk about next. So a simile is comparing two unlike objects using like or as. So be thinking of an example. You're gonna, it's literally using the word like or as. And some of you were, were giving me similes and metaphors. So this one, when you think someone is smart, you might say this, they're as bright, whoops, as a light bulb. As bright as a light bulb, so as and as. Can you think of any other similes, maybe? Hmm, any other similes? As bright as a light bulb. Oh, stand tall. Stand as tall as a tree, okay? 
We didn't use like. Let me try and think of one that has like. Um, as bright as light bulb, stand as tall as a tree. Hmm, what's a good one with like? Let me Google it really quick. When I can't think of something, this is what I do. I bet your teachers do it too. Simile, examples, using like. Let's see what they have. Oh, that's a good one. Have you ever heard anyone say, she sings like an angel, sings like an angel. Angels must sing very well, I don't know. Okay, sleep like a log, eat like a pig. Those are some other funny ones that came up. All right, so a metaphor is doing the exact same thing that a simile does um, without using like or as. So. You're, compa Ooh. You're comparing two unlike things, again, comparing two unlike things and by saying one is the other, okay? So you're basically saying how they are alike without using like or as. without using like or as. Good thing I'm not trying to win an award for the prettiest poster, right? Okay, so the world's a stage. Can you think of any other? The world's a stage. So a stage and the world are not things that are the same. So, what do you think? Any other metaphors you might think of? Um, sometimes you might hear people say, the apple of my eye, that means something that's special to them. Apple of my eye, right? Um, you might hear, oh, this one. <laughs> this one um, is like, I don't know how to explain this one. Um, I don't know. Batten down the hatches. People might say that when a storm is coming. Okay. And then we have hyperbole. That's a fun word to say it. Say it hyperbole. It's an exaggeration. My dad is very good at exaggerating. <laughs> so hyperbole. So I'm going to say um, it's an exaggeration and I need to make sure I spell exaggeration right. E-X-A-G. Exaggeration that, ooh, my handwriting can't be true. So, as thin as a toothpick, thin as a toothpick, could you think of any other hyperboles? Thin as a toothpick. That one's kind of fun. Let's see. Hyperbole examples. What do they have? Oh, I've said this one before. So hungry I could eat a horse. Obviously I can't, but I'm trying to exaggerate how hungry I am. So, excuse me, so hungry I, got the hiccups, could eat a horse. So hungry I could eat a horse. Those ones are kind of thing, fun. Oh, something I've said, I have a million things to do today million things to do. I don't really have a million things to do. That's me exaggerating. Million things to do. So people probably use hyperboles more than they realize. And then onomatopoeia is, um, so you're basically using sounds. So you're using the meaning of a word. to show something. So like 
bang, bam, bang, bam. What do you got? Boom, that's good, boom. Zap, zip, right? Yeah, so it's like sound words. I teach um, my second graders to use onomatopoeia in their writing a lot um, because it helps like the reader to see what you're talking about and how it might be feeling or if it's scary or bah, there was like a surprise. Those are always fun. So now we are going to look at some poetry and um, we're going to read the book through the first time and then we are going to read it again a second time and we are going to kind of analyze it um, and see if this author is using any figurative language, okay? Um, let me find, the. there we go. Okay, so this is written by Melissa Stewart and it's kind of talking about animals under the snow the, the title of it is Under the Snow, and this is being read with permission from Peachtree Publishing. So, Under the Snow. And remember, we know that poetry doesn't really have any rules, right? It can rhyme, it cannot rhyme, it can be long, it can be short, it can try and um, teach you something, it can try and make you feel something. So, we're gonna see what this one's all about. In the heart of winter, a deep layer of snow Blankets, fields, and forests, ponds, and wetlands. You spend your days sledding and skating and having snowball fights. But under the snow lies a hidden world. Hmm. Under the snow in a field. Dozens of ladybugs pack themselves into a gap in an old stone wall. Below them, a snake rests in a hole all its own. Voles spend their days tunneling through the snow. When they find a young tree, they slowly strip off layers of bark and eat them. Below the ground, a chipmunk snoozes for a few days at a time. Between naps, it snacks on the nuts and seeds stored in its burrow. Under the snow, in a forest, a morning cloak butterfly co takes cover in a pile of brush. Inside a rotting log, a centipede and a bumblebee queen remain silent and still until it's spring. A wood frog nestles in scattered leaves on the forest floor. It can freeze solid and still survive. Not far away, a woolly bear caterpillar spends the winter curled up in a tight ball. Just below the ground, a spotted salamander waits out the coldest months of the year. Deeper down, a woodchuck sleeps soundly all winter long. Its heart, weight, its heart rate drops and its breathing slows. The animal gets all the energy it needs from its thick layer of fat. Under the snow on a pond, bluegills circle slowly through the chilly water. They don't have enough energy to chase the water boatmen swimming nearby. A carp rests quietly on the muddy bottom. It, e it isn't even tempted by the water striders laying just a few inches away. Buried in the mud, a frog and a turtle wait out the winter. They never move and they barely breathe.
Under the snow in a wetland, a beaver family huddles together inside a cozy log lodge. When they get hungry, they swim to their food storage pile and munch on some sticks. But even on the coldest winter days, red spotted newts dodge and dart, whiz and whirl just below the ice. As time passes, the sun's rays slowly grow stronger. Each day is a little bit longer. Animals living in fields and forests, ponds and wetlands begin to get ready for spring. And so do you. Nice, so think about what were some of the things that you noticed this author did in this poem, Under the Snow. And it read a lot like a book to me, it really did. It was teaching us about how all these animals hibernate, but it was doing it very much like poetry. So I want you to think about what did you notice? Did you notice any of those figurative language skills being used. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I noticed or alliter alliteration, and I'm wondering if this is kind of um, personification right here. In the heart of winter, or maybe it's more like a metaphor in the heart of winter. I don't know, it could maybe be either one. But I, it, what it's saying is like in the middle of winter, at the very middle, because your heart's in, your, in the middle, right? The heart of winter, so like the most important part, because your heart's pretty important to your whole body, right? So that is definitely some figurative language. I also noticed lots and lots of alliteration, sledding and skating. And then even when she was describing um, the animals and what they were doing, she was using um, alliteration, slowly strip. And then it said, there was one part that I was like, oh my gosh. Where is it? Where is it? Um, oh, spotted salamander. So like she did that a lot with the animals. She would describe them using the same word that they started with. So spotted salamander, salamander. Then she said, deeper down, a woodchuck sleeps soundly. So she's using a lot of alliteration in this story. <clears throat> Okay, so we are going, I'm trying to see if there was one more example. I thought I marked them, but I guess not. Um, that I wanted to notice, but that's okay. So this is real teaching, friends. Oh, this, red spotted newts, dodge and dart, whiz and whirl. So she's using alliteration again. So we are really quickly going to write our own poem using some of these figurative language um, pieces. So, I'm gonna rip this paper out. We're gonna write a giant poem together. Okay, so, let me hang this up underneath here. And let's see what kind of poem we can come up with using these types of things. I think we should write about pajamas since we're having a pajama party. Maybe we call it that. Poetry pajama party. <laughs> Let's write about pajamas. Here we go. Pajama party. That's the name of our poem. Pajama party. Woo woo. Okay, so let's start thinking about 
what we want to do. Oh, we could use some personification here. Like we could give our pajamas, like real life human traits. What's something, um, pajamas. Yes, pajamas, people sleep. So I'm gonna say pajamas, sleep soundly. <laughs> hi, Molly. Molly's here. Do you want to say hi? Come here. Nope, she thinks I'm playing again. Pajamas sleep soundly. That could mean like pajamas, when you're not using them, they're like sleeping, right? But they can't really sleep, so we already use personification. Pajamas sleep soundly until, yeah, remember no rules, until bedtime. Pajamas sleep soundly until bedtime. Hmm, what else? Pajamas sleep soundly until bedtime. Ooh, I like it. Cozy, comfy, and usually you got cute jammies. Cute. And guess what? That could be all of our poem, right? Poems don't have to be super long. Poems don't have to be super short. We could end it right here. So let's read our poem with fluency. Pajama party. Pajamas sleep soundly until bedtime. Cozy, comfy, cute. Should we add maybe one more line? Cozy, comfy, cute. Hmm. Hmm. I like it. A simile? Let's say, as fuzzy as a fresh peach, because peaches are fuzzy. All right, there is our poem, and I hope you have fun at our pajama party today, our poetry pajama party. Remember, that's alliteration, and I will see you next time. Bye. made possible with support of Bank of America, Dana Brown Charitable Trust, Emerson, and viewers like you.